Orbital Gardens, this is Mission Control. We are confirming acquisition of your signal. You are live in 5, 4, 3, 2... Hello and welcome to episode 34 of Gardeners of the Galaxy, the podcast for all of the sentient beings in the universe who have a passion for plants. I'm Emma the Space Gardener and I will be your host as we explore gardening on Earth and beyond. How much do you know about the nitrogen cycle? That's a bundle of biological and geological processes that move nitrogen through the Earth's atmosphere and terrestrial and marine ecosystems. Plants need nitrogen to grow, but 78% of Earth's supply is in the atmosphere. So plants need help from nitrogen-fixing bacteria in the soil, which take nitrogen from the air and fix it into the soil. Either that, or a farmer with a handy bag of nitrogen-rich fertiliser. In this week's show, I'm talking to a scientist investigating the different processes involved in the nitrogen cycle and how different plants get their nitrogen fix. Before we get to that, though, I'd like to give a big shout-out to my Patreon supporters. From just £1 a month, you can join our community of space gardeners and support the show. Visit patreon.com forward slash gardeners the galaxy to find out more. So my guest on today's show is Luke Fountain, who's currently working towards his PhD at the University of Sheffield. His work with the nitrogen cycle could improve agricultural sustainability on Earth, allow us to develop more nitrogen-efficient crops, and even help us to grow food in space. Hi Luke, welcome to Gardeners of the Galaxy. Hi, how are you doing? Hi, um, it's brilliant to have you on the show today because you're doing some really interesting work. So you're a PhD candidate at the University of Sheffield and your research project is involving the ways that plants use nitrogen. So can you just tell us a little bit about that please? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, it's great to be here. So yeah, my, my PhD project is all about really, uh, like, like you say, about how plants use nitrogen. It's really about soil processes, particularly in agricultural soils and processes involved in the nitrogen cycle. So I work on particularly on two soil processes, both bacteria, predominantly bacterial processes called nitrification and denitrification. So I realize they're, they're quite big words. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll try and try and not use too much jargon. So there are really two, two inorganic forms of nitrogen that plants can use, and those are ammonium and nitrate, uh, which is why a lot of fertilizers uh, include ammonium nitrate um, so plants grow best uh, when they have both forms although they can grow on one form or the other in most cases okay i'll start with the with the easier one <laughs> so nitrification is is essentially the conversion of ammonium to nitrate uh, in soil that's all it is okay and it's uh, an aerobic process that requires oxygen because the oxygen is added to the nitrogen and it's carried out like i say by soil bacteria so on the face of it, that doesn't seem like a bad thing because plants can use both ammonium and nitrate. However, they are differently charged. So uh, nitrate is negatively charged, ammonium positively. And a lot of clay particles in soil are negatively charged. So ammonium sticks to them very, very well. and doesn't really move anywhere in the soil once it's added. Um, but of course, with nitrate, that's a different story. Yeah. Um, so nitrate is very mobile. It's very easily leached out of soil, um, especially after heavy rainfall. So, of course, that's bad. It's bad for a couple of reasons. The first is uh, if the nitrate is lost from the soil, it's not available to the plant, which means that farmers have to add more fertilizer to, to supply plants with the right amount of nitrogen, which, of course, is, is bad. Uh -huh. But additionally, uh, the nitrate can pollute water sources as well. Uh, so there's sort of the environmental impact as well. And then the third factor really leads me on to denitrification. So nitrate is actually the substrate for denitrification. Yep. So, so denitrification is slightly different because it's an anaerobic process. So it only happens in the absence of oxygen. And it is essentially the, the stepwise reduction or, or conversion of nitrate to various different nitrogen gases. If it goes all the way to completion, it produces dinitrogen. Uh, so nitrogen gas, which goes back into the atmosphere and that completes the nitrogen cycle. But unfortunately, in agricultural soils, it doesn't usually go that far and it stops at the step before and that results in the production of nitrous oxide, or N2O, which uh, I'm sure a lot of uh, listeners are aware is uh, a very, very potent greenhouse gas. So it's got 300 times the warming potential of CO2. And agriculture is a major, major contributor of N2O emissions. So, so of course, that's also bad. Uh, and, and like I say, it's also contributing to loss of nitrogen from the soil. So really, my PhD comes in at the mitigation steps of this. So some plants can actually 
inhibit the process of nitrification. It's, it's a relatively new field. Not that much is known about it at the moment, which is good from my point of view, of course. <laughs> so, you know, it would be in, in our interest to inhibit this process because we would essentially then be trapping nitrogen in the soil. So we would have to apply less. And that's where the whole agricultural sustainability aspect comes in. But we would also be reducing, hopefully reducing N2O emissions uh, through denitrification. Um, and N2O can actually be produced by nitrification as a byproduct as well. So uh, we would be hopefully reducing greenhouse gas emissions as well. I kind of have two main strands to my work at the moment. So I started off actually not by looking at nitrification and denitrification, but looking at the plants themselves. Um, so I work in barley, um, which I'm sure you're aware is a very important crop here in the UK. <laughs> yep. <laughs> For numerous reasons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's certainly the first thing that comes to mind. So so I spent a lot of time in the first couple of years of my PhD. So I should mention I'm just going into my fourth year now. So I've been working on this for quite a while now. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, I've got one year left. And I've been looking at a phenomenon called nitrogen preference. So this is, it's, again, it's really simple. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that plants can take up both ammonium and nitrate. However, some plants do show a preference for one form over the other. Now, barley tends to be a nitrate preferring species just because it's generally grown in quite dry soils with high nitrification rates. So there's a lot more nitrate available than there is ammonia. So I've been doing a lot of work uh, actually using a hydroponic system that I spent a lot of time building um, at the start of my PhD, which has allowed me to, to screen numerous different barley varieties for their ammonium and nitrate preference. Uh, and I found significant variation, which is really cool. So, of course, at the moment, that should be taken with a pinch of salt because a hydroponic system does not replicate a real world agricultural soil. So, of course, that, that is the next step of this work. But the reason I'm really interested in that is because I, I have this idea that uh, if a plant prefers ammonium, it would probably be in their interest to inhibit the process of nitrification because mm -hmm. they're going to be competing with the soil bacteria for the ammonium that's added to the soil. Whereas a plant that prefers nitrate and doesn't really take up as much ammonium probably isn't that bothered. Mm -hmm. So by looking at these two contrasting sort of groups of, of barley cultivars, we might be able to start to identify how the plants are actually controlling these processes, which is what we really want to do. Yeah. That's kind of the first aspect. and I, I won't say any more about that. Um, and then the, the later aspect that I've been working on this year. It's, it's occupied virtually all of my time all year. It's been a horribly long experiment, <laughs> and hopefully we're going to get some really nice data out of it. Um, so I've been screening 200 barley cultivars right. for variation in their nitrification and denitrification rates, which is a very lengthy process. So I've built a new system, uh, what I call a tension table system, to facilitate this. So uh, I spent a lot of time developing that. And that really allows me to control the amount of moisture that is in the soil, very, very, very finely control it. And that's important because, as I mentioned, nitrification is an aerobic process, denitrification is anaerobic. And really, the way to control the amount of oxygen that's in the soil is to control the amount of water that's in the soil. Mm -hmm. um, so by, by changing the, the soil moisture, you can promote one process over the other, which allows you to then easily screen them. So I spent a lot of time doing that, and I'm now in the thick of analysing all the data from that experiment. <laughs> so <fun> hopefully, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So hopefully we will we will start to see um, some variation in in those come out as well. Um, and the the preliminary data that I have certainly that shows uh, it appears to be the case, um, which is which is great. So of course the next question is. Do the varieties that show high nitrification rates also show a tendency to prefer ammonia? So that's the million dollar question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting either way, though, right? Because yeah. if, if, they, if there is no link there, then it suggests that there is something else at play that is having a larger effect on, on the, these processes. So, yeah, I, I guess that's, that's kind of a summary. So like, like I say, the real end goal of this work is to potentially identify future barley breeding targets uh, and maybe in, even in other crops if we can show that it's the case in other crops yeah. that are uh, more efficient at using their nitrogen or, or keeping the nitrogen in the soil and reducing greenhouse gas emissions um, which obviously is contributing to agricultural sustainability which is what we're all about. Well, that's brilliant that is absolutely fascinating and you're talking about 
improving the sustainability of agriculture on Earth, but I know that you're also looking into growing plants in space. So how did you get into that? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a longer story. <laughs> <laughs> so I will start with the, with the usual thing that everybody says. I've always been interested in space exploration, you know, ever since I was a kid, as I'm sure nearly everybody who listens yeah. to your podcast has been. So particularly human exploration. And of course, I've always had the goal of wanting to be an astronaut. And I actually applied for the latest call for Eastern astronauts, which I is a lifelong goal of mine. So that was a, a, a great, great uh, crowning achievement of my career <laughs> to finally be qualified enough to apply for that, along with the, the 22 and a half thousand other people, of course. But <laughs> it's nice to have thrown my hat in the ring. Yeah. So I've always had the goal of becoming an astronaut in mind, but I've always wanted to go the scientific route. I've always had a real passion for science. And the landscape of that has changed over the years. So at school, it was always oh, physics, you know, astrophysics. That's all I want to do. You get to A-level and you realise, actually, that's quite hard. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I, did, I actually did geology at A-level and I got really interested in planetary geology for a yeah. while. But then I, I was really grabbed by uh, genetics, actually. I did a genetics module and that really led me on to doing a degree in molecular biology um, and then a, a master's degree in plant molecular biology. That kind of drove me down the plant route. But yeah, coming back to the, the space stuff. I'd always been following research that was going on in space uh, as sort of a, a passing interest. Read an article, I think it was an interview or something with Joy Massa about the veggie program yeah. a few years ago now. And I was like, oh, wow, we're growing plants in space. How did I not know about this? You know, and then that, that kind of really jumped up a level when the Advanced Plant Habitat launched in 2017, I think it was. Somewhere around there, yeah. Somewhere around there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it was kind of around the time when I was thinking about what my next steps were going to be in. Um, and I said, OK, yeah, plant science maybe is a good a good career move because this is going to be really big in the field of space exploration in the coming years. Yeah. It kind of really drove me down that path. Now, of course, breaking into that field is very, very difficult. And the first real opportunity, I guess, came with the Space Chile Challenge, actually. Um, so I, I got involved. I was a bit late to the game with it. <laughs> But, but the COVID pandemic really helped me um, get, get <laughs> yeah. into that. It was a really, a really, you know, one of the one of the few benefits really, really allowed me to sort of delve into this field and get involved in the field for the first time. And, you know, so I, I actually started using the hydroponic system that I built for my PhD. That was kind of how I got into it. I thought, oh, this will be, not many people are growing hydroponically. This would be quite cool to try. Yeah. And, and I had varying success. <laughs> I did get some red chili peppers um, that were indeed very hot, but I've not been able to, to replicate it since. I've got a, a smaller system at home now that I use, and I, I've got some, some chili peppers coming off that at the moment. So fingers crossed I finally figured it out but <laughs> <laughs> it's taken a while but yeah it's 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 been a fun a fun journey getting there and, yeah. and you know learned a lot on the way and the Facebook group the community are, are, are really great uh, Jacob's great um, yeah. um so yeah and then you know I guess at the same time I, I'd start having these conversations with my PhD supervisors around thinking about how some of my work might actually relate to growing food in space particularly around around nitrogen cycling you know so we're really gearing towards essentially manufacturing, you know, either bespoke plant varieties or bespoke microbial communities that manipulate nitrogen cycling in such a way that you can keep as much of it in the system as possible so that it's available to plants. And of course, we're a long way off getting to that stage, but that is something that certainly lends itself to um, hydroponic systems and controlled environment agriculture, which of course are the front runners for future off-world growth techniques. Yeah. Now, of course, it's not within the remit of my PhD, so I, I'm, <laughs> I'm fairly limited in, in sort yeah. of that, that aspect of it at the moment. But as part of my PhD, I do have to do a three-month placement. And I thought that was the perfect opportunity to, to break into this field. Then COVID hit, so I started sort of thinking of what I could do uh, here in Sheffield that would still allow me to, to gain experience in the field. So I, I'd kind of been, I'd been chatting with Jacob Torres uh, a lot. And we kind of came up with a really cool project that married well with the PHO4 mission, um, which was as yet to go up to the International Space Station. Of course, it's, it's running at the moment and it's, it's uh, currently been very successful. It's doing really well, yeah. And the idea really was to uh, design uh, an experiment where we would test a synthetic polyurethane foam that has been developed in Sheffield uh, over the last few years by by one of my good friends, Dr. Harry Wright. It was really developed as an alternative to rock roll in urban horticulture. That was why it was developed a more sustainable option. 
he has long thought that there might be potential space applications. And we decided that I would use my placement to set up an experiment to test this against what NASA are currently using, which is the, the Arcalite model. So that, that's really where it came out. And then I thought, oh, this is great. You know, I can link this to the Space Chili Challenge and we can have two sort of systems where, where they're very similar to the advanced plant habitat. And we can have the Arcalite in one, which is, would essentially be a ground control of the, of the PHO-4 mission. Yeah. And then in the other, we can have the film and, and we can do a comparison experiment and we can link it to what they're doing in space. And that would be great. And it was when we were thinking about the links to space that we realized, actually, this offers quite a unique outreach opportunity. And, and it was really from all of these discussions that we, we started talking to, to the outreach department, the public engagement department, and they were kind of like, oh, wow, this is, this is really exciting. And, and kind of the outreach aspect sort of took over a little bit to start with. And the experiment took, took a back burner. And it really, we really started to focus on, right, well, how can we bring this to the public? And we decided that having a small system and just showing a small system that looks like what it looks like in space and you can point to all the different bits and what they do and all the technologies that are involved would be a brilliant way to facilitate discussions around this with the general public. Absolutely. And at the same time, obviously, we were developing this system so that we could run this experiment. So there's kind of two strands. And that was really where our Space EA project stemmed from. <laughs> I'm sure we're going to talk about more about that project in a minute. So. That, yeah, that's the plan. <laughs> um, so you called it Space EA, but it it's, stands for Space Controlled Environment Agriculture. Yes. I talked a little bit about what that involves, but you are talking about an outreach challenge. So bringing that to the public and allowing them to get involved in something called the Space Foam Crop Growth Challenge. Yes. So <laughs> how are people going to be able to get involved with that? That's kind of our, our next step with the project. So we've lent on a lot of the, the knowledge and experience gained from Jacob and from the Space Chili Challenges. We anticipate it being in a similar sort of format. We're going to be giving out small cubes of our foam. So, so that's what we envision it's going to look like. And you can just put it in a, in a plastic bottle or something like that. Uh -huh. um, and we're going to be growing plants in it. So we're, we're kind of in the midst of setting that up. We're figuring out some of the final details. And we hope to have it set up by the end of the year at latest early next year. If people want to follow along at the moment, I mean, we do have social media uh, set up. We have a Facebook group, uh, which I believe is called the Space Foam Crop Growth Challenge. Or something <laughs> yeah. Like those we'll lines, um, the show it, yeah. you'll find it, yeah. yeah. Um, and we're also on Instagram and Twitter as well, at Space EA Challenge. Trying to keep people up to date and, and really make people feel like they're involved with the project. Um, that's, that's really what we want. It's always been about getting the public involved in, and excited about this sort of research. So we really want to share what we do day to day in our work as well as get, get people uh, involved practically. So, but yeah, any information on how to join the challenge uh, and how to receive your packs, we're hoping to either, we're either going to be growing uh, lettuce or something like basil, something that's, that's quite small, fast growing, easy to grow, easily harvestable crop. And we will likely be providing different varieties as well. Um, so the whole point of this challenge is to test the suitability of the foam for growing various different varieties. So yeah, that's that's kind of really where, where we're going with it. Excellent. Sounds fabulous. I will be waiting with bated breath for when you're ready to send out your foam. <laughs> <laughs> Okie dokie. So, I mean, you said fairly early on in our, our little chat here that you would like to be an astronaut. So obviously at some point you are dreaming of going into space. So... When you go, assuming that all your space botany work is covered for you, if you can take a personal plant to be your personal plant companion, what would you choose and why? So I've been thinking about this for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> it's tricky. <laughs> I listen to your podcast. So I've, I've always thought, oh, well, if I get the chance to go on this, what would I say? You know? <laughs> um, and I think I would go with more of a less conventional option. I think I would go for a garlic plant. Oh. So I've never actually grown garlic before myself, but apparently it's fairly easy to grow. Um, requires little maintenance uh, other than watering, depending on where you're growing it. So, yeah, but I, I use garlic in uh, pretty much everything that I cook. Um, and <laughs> given that at least current food tends to be a little bit bland in space, yeah. um, it would be nice to have something to, to give that a little bit of flavour. 
Of course, the other astronauts might not be particularly I'm... happy <laughs> unless they're eating it as well. But... <laughs> I was going to say, I'm sure I've read something about the fact that, you know, the, the amount of garlic on board is, is limited due to the, you know, you know the after effects. <laughs> but I'm saying I'm, I'm a big garlic fan. So, yeah, bring it on. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that would be great. Excellent. No, that's a brilliant choice because it's very healthy. Um, there'd be some yeah, really good benefits to that, as you say. If it stinks, never mind, eh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's brilliant. Yes, you can definitely come because I like garlic. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your research with us. That's absolutely fabulous. I hope that you will come back when you're a little bit further down the road and we've got Space Foam Crop Growth Challenge underway and we can see some results from some of this because, yeah, it sounds really exciting. Yeah, definitely. That would be be great. So that would be brilliant. So I will put the links in the show notes to how people can keep up to date with the challenge so that they're primed, ready for when that comes out. And here at Gardeners of the Galaxy, we will keep an eye on your work because it's just brilliant. (laughs) <laughs> yeah that's great and thank you very much for having me on uh it's it's, it's been great and yeah stay tuned i guess <laughs> brilliant. further updates on, on how to get involved well that's brilliant it has been lovely to meet you great to have some uk space plant people yeah it's great i i was so excited when i found your podcast because i was like oh, there's somebody else in the uk that's interested in this <laughs> i'm stuff. sure there's not just the two of us <laughs> <laughs> yeah we'll have our own uk space plants agency that, you yeah know, exactly yeah, let's one just go, yeah. <laughs> brilliant okay <laughs> thanks luke <laughs> bye bye that's it for this episode don't forget you can sign up to support the show at patreon.com forward slash gardeners of the galaxy Podchaser is a great place to review podcasts and you can find me there by searching for gardeners of the galaxy At the moment, I'm posting daily space gardening photos on social media and you can find me at Orbital Gardens on Twitter and Instagram and Gardens of the Galaxy has its own Facebook page. I'll be launching a new episode in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, thanks for listening. Goodbye. Orbital Gardens is mission control, confirming termination of your signal. I've thought about it and the plant I would take to Mars would be an oak tree because I want to breed squirrels on Mars. Mission control out.